So I'm Max Kuhn. Uh, I'll be talking, talking at you for a while, uh, for a few hours. So just some background. Uh, I work for our studio. Um, I started there about a year and a half ago uh, doing modeling uh, for the Tidyverse. So I work in the Tidyverse group. Um, before that, I had spent, um, I don't know, like 13 years in drug discovery um, at a pharmaceutical company, um, mostly doing uh, computational biology and chemistry and a fair amount of our um, package writing. So I was lucky enough to be able to write packages and get them um, publicly distributed. They, that was, strangely, that's one thing they weren't worried about, uh, proprietary things. So, um, so Carrot and a bunch of other packages, um, I wrote those. And I worked in diagnostics, uh, molecular diagnostics for a while, doing algorithms and things like that. So most of my, um, and I'm trained as a statistician, so most of my background is in statistics, machine learning, and things like that. Um, so, uh, so, so just some background, if you've never seen Carrot, it's this like 13-year-old package that has like a 13-year-old interface on it. And, um, and it's basically like a wrapper around a bunch of different um, machine learning models. So instead of you having to learn the syntax for every particular package, which can be very, very different, um, it's kind of like a unified interface. And at the time, in like 2004, when I started writing it, um, there was very little like infrastructure for machine learning in R. I mean, there were some things, but like if you wanted to calculate sensitivity and specificity, like there was no functions to do that. Or if you wanted to do cross validation, there wasn't really any infrastructure around that. Or parallel processing and things like that. So, so uh, a lot of that was just built into care. And the reason I'm, I'm talking about that is I'll show you in a, in a minute in the notes. Um, I have the carrot's always going to be around and still be a thing. But with our studio, I have the opportunity to sort of rewrite in more sensible ways now that I, I think I know a lot more about software engineering um, and redo a bunch of things that, you know, now I know where all the bodies are buried and ways not to do things. Uh, and recipes is, is something that's sort of um, something I've been thinking about for, for quite a long time, like 15, 20 years. And then um, starting at our studio, I finally had the, the time to sit back and really figure out how to do this for real. Um, so anyway. Um, we get started. So there's a there's a GitHub repo um, just here. So you can clone that or just download it. And in there is an HTML file, an R file. Um, if you don't want to run HTML, there's a PDF in there. Um, so I don't have any breakout sessions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute code as we go. Um, and uh, and I'd prefer to have this like. You know, I'm jokingly going to say this with Dirk in the room. I want this to be a conversation, so, you know, when, when you have a question, don't hesitate to, like, stop and say, wait a minute, go back there. I didn't understand that. Or what do you think about this? Um, don't wait till the end, because I'd rather hear it as we're going. Um, but I'll, I'll stop and execute code as we go, and then if there's any problems you have and things like that, we can, we can take five minutes and, and fix things if we need to as we go. Sound good? Okay. All right. There we go. See that okay? Should I enlarge that at all or try to? Okay. So, um, so recipes is part of like a growing series of packages um, that are uh, in the sort of like in the tidyverse. So the tidyverse is if you haven't experienced it, and you probably have. Um, it's basically a collection of packages that work very well together um, and follow a, a fair amount of similar. Uh, design aesthetics, um, things like using tibbles instead of data frames. That's like a, you know, probably a better implementation of a data frame. Things like using functional programming and per, um, and um, and under the hood we do things like non-standard evaluation. So, for example, and I'll go through this in a little more detail if you're new to this stuff. Um, but if you've ever used ggplot, when you create a ggplot, it doesn't really do anything until you actually, you know, hit enter or explicitly print the plot. And one thing that it, it kind of did um, that opened a lot of doors is it sort of defers execution on a lot of things. So, you know, if you create a ggplot and save it to an object, you haven't really done anything but specified what you want to plot in, in re references to what data frame or what columns and things like that. And so with this sort of like deferred um, execution of code, that really opens a door for a lot of things that we can do. Um, and recipes is sort of um, takes advantage of that to a great degree. So in the Tidyverse, we try to, you know, here's the, the tenants, you know, we try to use existing data uh, structures. Uh, is anybody here um, who's used the pipe before, Magruder pipe? Okay, that's good. Um, so, you know, we try to use or set things up so it's easily used with the pipe. 
um, functional programming, especially around per, and then you know have some make some design choices about how we specify variables, how we name variables. You would not, maybe you would, but I did not believe how much time our group spends on names um, uh, of functions and things like that. So there's a collection of packages. Broom's been around for a while. There's um, R sample. We'll, we'll look at recipes a little bit. Um, well, we'll look at recipes a lot. We'll look at R sample a little bit and um, one or two of the others that are on here. But, um, but you know, we're, we're building a collection of modeling packages. The thing about modeling is it's a lot more diffuse, um, a lot more, I think, the, larger in scope than tidyverse proper, which is mostly concerned about data ingestion, data manipulation, and visualization. Um, and, and their package dependencies tend to be a lot more um, focused, whereas on the modeling side, the package dependencies tend to be a lot more uh, numerous. Um, one thing we're doing right now is, um, or I'm doing right now, is putting together a tidy models package, which is kind of like the tidyverse package that will you know, load and install the, the main functions or packages in the tidyverse that are related to modeling. So that's not on CRAN yet, but I'm hoping like in a week or two it will be um, to, to make loading and installing these things a little bit more easy. Uh, you know, so the, 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 one of the things that's nice about the tidyverse, it's very modular. So, you know, dplyr, dplyr, for example, doesn't have a function that at the same time does filtering and, and merging and creation of new variables. It's very modular. You can chain them together and do sort of things. And, you know, that's like you know, part of what the tidy approach is. And probably the most untidy package on CRAN is Carrot. Um, because it's like this big monolithic thing that you have this function call that's like seven things that you specify in one call. It tries to do it all at once. Um, and so, you know, it's great. And I love it and I still use it quite a bit. Um, but, it, but it's really the opposite of what the, the tidy modeling and the tidyverse approach is, is to have things that, you know, different modules of packages that work together. And that enables us to do a lot more with the, the tidy modeling infrastructure that we could do with Carrot. Because if you want to make a change to Carrot, it sort of affects everything. Everything in the tidyverse side is very um, sort of siloed. Uh, but as you'll see towards the end, we can use recipes with the higher level functions like Carrot, and we can use it um, as we go with uh, our sample and a bunch of other things. There will be high level APIs for the tidyverse. So, you know, the thing about <coughs> Carrot is it's a really high level API. You want to tune a model. It's very simple. It's like five lines of code and, you know, irrespective of what type of model you want to fit. And that's a, that's a really nice thing, and it makes a lot of choices for you. It has really, I think, sensible defaults. And we don't have that API just yet for the tidy modeling approach, but, but that is definitely coming. Um, so what you see here is probably a lower level um, usage of recipes and things like that than what you will have access to in, let's say, another year. Okay. <clears throat> so the example I'm going to use is uh, predicting house prices. So you know, we're kind of sick of the of irises and houses in Boston. So to change things up, we decided to look at houses in Iowa. Uh, and so, um, so there was this paper in 2011 where this guy assembled it. He basically scraped the Iowa City uh, Assessor's Office and pulled off a bunch of data on houses um, and put that in a file. Uh, we created a, we'll look at, here's a link to the raw file right here, which we'll use in a minute. But I put together a package called Ames Housing. Um, which has the original raw data in it and a, and a more nicely processed version that, you know, we handle missing data in, the, in the, the packaged version of the data set much better than the original. Another thing we spent a lot of time doing, which is way harder than I thought it would be, is geocode all the, the, um, the properties. So we have their longitude and latitude and things like that, which is a pretty, you know, good thing for prediction. Um, so when I start, you know, going through basic tidyverse things, I'll use the raw data set, but we'll actually use the, the data set that's in the package to do the analysis. Um, yeah, so that's the data set we're going to use. The outcome is the sale price, and there's 81 predictors, and it's all sorts of things like, you know, different variations of geography, like longitude, latitude, neighborhood, um, different aspects of houses, like, you know, square footage on the first floor, on the second floor, it, does it have a driveway? You know, all sorts of like qualitative um, variables, and probably about I'd say about a third of them are, are uh, about a third of them are qualitative, and about you know the rest are um, I'm sorry, a third are quantitative, and the the rest are things like you know um, uh, like what's the quality of your pool and things like that. Um, there are some there are some variables I've decided nobody else does this. I've decided to eliminate when we do the modeling, there's some things that seem like outcomes to me in the data set. They're like overall quality. So they have these like condition variables which seem to be a little bit more objective, like what's the condition of your pool? 
Right, but then they have like quality things, which seems like it's really more of an outcome, like do I like what I see? And you know, and that's highly, highly correlated with sale price, but that seems like it's more of an outcome. So when I do the notes here, I'll eliminate those variables. I think I do that here, um, because it just seems like it's a, it's a circular sort of argument. All right, so has anybody here gone to school in Ames, or been in Ames, or lived in Ames? Okay. I'm dying to ask questions that die in a bunch of people, and you know. So here's a little leafless, leaflet plot of all the properties, sort of coded, color coded by neighborhood. Um, if you're wondering what the black hole is here, that's where the, um, the university, um, the, the neighborhood, because there's no public housing, it's not a black hole. Sorry, uh, anybody watching this on video, I apologize up front. Um, but you know, there's not any public properties that are there for sale. Um, and you know you have like this little cluster here down by the, the airport and things like that. Um, you know the data as we get them, there are some interesting things, like you have data that I don't know the, the neighborhood doesn't seem like it's all that uh, good of a data point. Like this, the, here's Somerset here, but you know like half a block away is something that's in Northridge. There's a lot of examples of that in this data set when you look around it. Like um, maybe it's these guys down here. You have a couple of data points that are in whatever that is and uh, that are inside the Crawford neighborhood. So, you know, neighborhood's nice, it's a qualitative predictor, but um, maybe not the, the, the best uh, or more specific variable. Well, it's probably self-reported and people maybe don't want to say they live in the neighborhood, they do. Um, so anyway, it's a pretty good data set and that's what I'll use. It's a pretty good teaching data set. So just to walk through some tidyverse syntax, if you've never experienced it, um, a lot of times, you know, you know, when you do modeling and, and different things, we have to specify what variables or what columns in a data set we want to use. And in a tidyverse, we tend not to want to like have some argument to a function that is a character string of names. So we tend to use more functional programming approaches. So instead of having, you know, if we want to get the, the sepal columns out of the iris data set, instead of passing it a vector of character strings, you know, we have all these selectors like contains the, you know, the phrase sepal in the column. So there's a bunch of times where, you know, uh, people who knew this, you know, you go to select a variable for like um, ggplot or something like that, and you're not quoting the variable name. And that kind of freaks people out sometimes. Uh, that's one difference. Another thing is the pipe, which a lot of you have seen, but if you wanted to do a, a merge of two data sets, A and B, you know, here's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to um, say merge and A um, is right on interjoined with B. So it basically substitutes um, the preceding argument to be the first argument of the function below it. Um, there's some nice, it, it's aesthetically much, much, much easier to read. You can chain these things together. So if you want to do like five or six things at a time, you can look at it and it's, it's, it's much, much easier to read. There's some behind the scenes things that we can do by doing this also. Um, and sometimes it, it saves you um, keeping things in memory. So a lot of times we would like make an operation, save a copy of a data set, and then do the next operation, save a copy of the data set. And with the, with the pipe, you, know, you tend to chain these things together so you don't have these intermediate steps you don't care about saved in your session. So, um, so that's nice. Um, so if we load the tidyverse package, that brings in um, you know, all the tidyverse uh, packages. Um, all the individual packages. And here's just an example. So I'm in this data set called Ames, and I'm going to use readars read.delim and give it the link to the actual raw data set and tell it it's tab delimited. And then the pipe will then say, so the original data set has a bunch of column names that have spaces in it, which is not, you know, it's not forbidden in R. You can get around that using back ticks, but I prefer to have like underbars. So, you know, the first thing we do is rename all the variables that, you know, basically does a find or replace on spaces and converts them to underbars. Um, sale price, oddly, did not have a space, so we convert, you know, sale price one word to sale underbar price. Um, there were like two or three properties that had missing values for their electrical systems, and you would, maybe you would, but you would perhaps not believe the amount of scrutiny these houses have come under people, and you'll see at the very last slide, like, you know, people are like, probably calling people's residents, like, what's your electrical system? I need to know for this data set. Um, but there's like two or three that there's just no way of knowing, and it's not worth coding them as missing. So I just decided to get rid of those. And then, um, you know, at the very end here, I get rid of um, an ordering variable. There's the, the ID of the house. And there was something about the, the year that the garage was built I wanted to get rid of. And so that's like an example of using the pipe. We're chaining a bunch of these things together instead of saving all these like work in progress versions of the data set. 
And then, you know, um, dplyr can do a lot of summary things, like if we want to get the mean price um, for each value of the alley, um, we can do that. We can, um, you know, divide by the sale price by 1,000. So again, in terms of functional programming, this is a bunch of open code here that looks kind of weird. Um, although a lot of people, and I, they're like, that's not a function. It's like, well, it's kind of encased in the function. They're like, well, that's really weird. I'm like, yeah, but you're doing, that was subset for years. So it's, it's not really that new. Um, but as an example, you can do some summary statistics here and get, you know, for the, the gravel driveways and see what their average house price is. Um, and then, you know, it gives you the NAs, which means it does not have a alley. Um, so in the process version of the data set, instead of it being missing, we just said like no alley. Okay, so that's a lot of the, the work we did to get the data set looking a little bit better. Here's just an example ggplot. So across each garage type, we do a little violin plot. So these are like kernel density estimates that are reflected against each other and are supposed to look like some weird violin. Um, and you can see, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity and uh, attached uh, garages versus, let's say, the uh, carports and things like that in terms of their sale price. So if you've never seen ggplot code, it's the same thing. We specify what we want on the x-axis, we want on the y-axis, and then instead of pipes, uh, until recently, instead of pipes, we use pluses, and then we can say, you know, how we want to represent the data in a violin plot. We can, you know, log scale the y-axis and change aesthetic things like the um, labels. This is probably all review to people, um, just to be on the safe side. Now, uh, I think less people have used PER than, let's say, ggplot, and PER is really nice. At the very minimum, it does a lot, like I'm continually find, I'm in the tiny Tidyverse group and I'm continually finding things that PER does, I'm like, wow, okay. Um, <clears throat> but you, if you're not going to go that deep into it, the one thing you can think about is a nice, sensible version of LApply. Okay, so it does things where you can, you can do calculations across uh, vectors or across lists and things like that very efficiently. So, for example, um, if we wanted to take our, um, our data set and split it up into a list of data sets, uh, data frames, by the uh, value of their alley. Remember, we had um, paved, gravel, and no alley. Um, so what it does is, what split will do is it will actually get rid of all the NAs. But what you get at the end of it is you get a list with all the houses that had gravel alleys and um, a list of all the uh, houses that had um, paved alleys. And so just to show you as an example what you can do with per, um, most of the per functions you will, you'll use are, are start with the prefix map. And so, you know, map is kind of like v apply or l apply. You want to operate, for example, with a list and have some function and then get a return value. And, and the nice thing is if you've done any programming like old school like me, um, you would then like unlist l apply. It's like pre, this is pre v apply, you know. You unlist the results, and then you know if you, you might have to course it to the type that you want. Um, but but per is much more sensible. So if you say I'm going to map across this this um, list and execute a function, and I know it's going to give me an integer back, you can use map under bar integer, and it gives you an integer vector back. So that just saves you a lot of headache and trouble. So if I want to see how many data points, I mean they're kind of listed here. Um, if I use map here and say how many rows are in each data set, I get, a, I get a list of integers back. But map under bar int gives me uh, an integer vector, which is nice. Um, you don't have to use it on vectors. You can sort of, I mean, this is a ridiculous block of code here, but you know, let's say you want for every sale price, you want to emulate like a for loop and just divide them by a thousand to get the, you know, the dollars and thousands. You could run um, map, return a double, because you're starting off with a double, and get that back. So, um, so it doesn't have to be a list, um, but I'll be using I'll be using map quite a bit in the notes. So if you've never seen that, I'll mostly be using the context of like doing operations across a list. So minimum usage of per. All right, so that's like the technical background. So like, why are we here? What do we want to do with recipes? What is this thing? And uh, and how did you come up with a cool cupcake hex sticker? Um, that's my son. Um, so, you know, here's the thing is, you know, a lot of times before modeling, um, we want to do um, some sort of pre-processing our data. And sometimes it's something innocuous, like, you know, I have a predictor in my model, like alley, right? So let's say I have paved gravel and no alley as a predictor. I might think that's important, and I want to run that in a linear model. A linear model can't really handle um, qualitative variables, like it needs numbers. So, you know, typically what we would do with a variable like that is we convert it to dummy variables or indicator variables. Um, so that's like an operation you would do on your data. Sometimes there's things like innocuous like centering and scaling. 
Um, like you want to make everything on the same scale. Um, and then there's, you know, other things you might want to do that are a little more complex um, and maybe um, happens less often is maybe you have like um, in this data set the uh, living area is in square footage and is, I guess you might expect, it's, it's fairly right skewed. So you have a lot of properties with, you know, small square footage and fewer that have much larger value. So that distribution is pretty right skewed. That's not the end of the world for a lot of models, but um, you know, a lot of models like linear regression are working off of squared residuals, and when you have like outliers, um, you know, or they're they're squaring something that's a difference from mean at some point, um, that can sometimes blow up the calculations and give you a little bit of inaccuracy. So one thing you might want to do is have some transformations. You might want to say, hey, log the living area variable, or Maybe if you've ever heard like the Box-Cox transformation, you might want to say estimate an appropriate transformation for these data. So that's an example of something you might want to do. Um, I mentioned encodings. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. In, in encodings, basically, you can think of that as either making dummy variables or thinking about ways to represent data. So I'm, I've been working a lot. I'm writing another book on like feature engineering. And that's just the fancy computer science term of like, what's the best way to represent my data? So if you think like if you have a predictor in your data set, that's time, right? So you have like a, a date time field, you know, you could represent that. If you need to make a numeric representation of it, you know, do you do that by its year, the day of the week? You know, how, how do I do that? Do I do it like number of days from some reference date? So there's all these different ways you can encode variables. And the key here, in the thing you want to spend time thinking about is how do I do that to maximize its performance in the model? So the problem with that is it's really model dependent. That if you're using like random forest or some sort of tree ensemble, that's very, very tolerant to the functional form of your predictor. But if you're putting something in a model that's like a linear model, then you might want to spend some time investigating like, you know, what's the relationship between day of the week and the outcome or month or, you know, is there a change on holidays? You know, so the whole idea of feature engineering is spending some time usually visually and sometimes quantitatively um, discovering or creating different representations of your data. So I, I used to work in drug discovery, and for Alzheimer's, there's a very effective predictor. Um, it's actually two values, two protein values. And individually, they're not all that spectacular, but their ratio is very predictive of onset of Alzheimer's. And so that's a good example of, you know, we would never call back then, but feature engineering. How do I best put my data in a model? And recipes is basically like an interface to do that, to do either innocuous pre-processing things like centering and scaling, or do things that are, are going to improve your model. Um, it also includes things like imputation, um, if you have missing data. Um, it's not doing multiple imputation from the classical like inferential statistics, but if you're doing more predictive models where, you know, in predictive models, we're really worried about imputation about what's the best possible estimate of that missing predictor value. We're not so much worried about, like, how can I do my imputation so my t-statistic has the right distribution at the end of all this. So it's more based on performance rather than distributional assumptions. But, you know, imputation would be another example of what you could do with recipes. We, need, we have missing data. We need to make that better to work in our model. So how can we manipulate our data? Almost everything I'm doing here uh, is uh, thinking about the predictors in your model, not necessarily the outcome. Although you can use it for that. So here's an example. This is a, a real data set that's in caret. Um, the, the variables are very arcane. Um, so I just call them predictor A and predictor B. It's a classification problem. You can see there's blue and red circles. And when you look at it, um, you know, the things I look at when I see when I look at this data set is they seem to be pretty right skewed. So there's a lot of data in the bottom corner. Uh, in both dimensions and less, you know, towards the center of it. So, you know, it seemed to be pretty right skewed. Um, I see a separation between the blue and the red, um, but it's weird because it's not, it looks like it's almost along a diagonal line. So, um, so the question is like, you know, how, and if I were fitting like a logistic regression, you know, these are pretty highly correlated variables and, you know, that's not a great thing to put into a linear or logistic regression model. So, you know, the question is like, you know, how would I, is there a better way to represent my data here? And there's actually, for this data set, there's like two or three different things you can do to make this a lot better. But just based on this plot, um, and this might be the only time I'll ask for audience participation, so don't worry about this. But, uh, I mean, does, does this like, when I talk to non-statisticians about this, they never see it. But is there anything that you guys would look at this and say, oh, yeah, you should obviously do this to your data? Log transformation? They're skewed, right? Anything else? Yeah, the scale's different. Um, 
Yeah, so if we're using like PLS or an Ornet like that or something like that, we probably want to center and scale them. Um, the thing that rings out for me, um, which works pretty well in this data set, is when I see two variables that are, are greater than zero and right skewed and are correlated, I think ratio. So if you took the ratio of these two different predictors, that actually is a pretty good, um, that shows a lot of um, importance in terms of differentiating the blue and the red circles. Um, I think that works a little bit better is doing basically what was mentioned here is estimating a transformation, like doing essentially what's called a Box-Cox transformation. Uh, individual in each, um, if you do this individual in each predictor, basically what seems like it's optimal is doing the inverse transformation. And so if you plot the inverse of A and the inverse of B, you, know, you still see you know, the separation, but it's a little bit easier for a model to, to get a handle on that and to, um, to deal with that since you've basically eliminated the skewedness. Um, this is an interesting example in a lot of ways because these are two variables that it, you, you look at this plot, if you look at it either from the X or Y dimensions, these variables are clearly like have some ability to separate the blue from the red, but only in concert together. So if you do a box plot of the classes by inverse of A and do another box plot by inverse of B, they completely overlap the classes. So this is a good, good teaching example because these predictors have like an area of the RC curve of like 0.8 something, but individually it's like 0.5 all the way. So these are two predictors that only work together um, and doing a ratio or some other things like even PCA on this would, would um, get you down to one variable. So that's another thing you can do. But this is, you know, when I teach this to people, this is like a really, really simple example of feature engineering. There, you know, it wouldn't be tragic to like, you know, put these data in logistic regression and just let it work it out, or a neural network or something like that. But again, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like the more we look at our data, the more comfortable we're with it, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe not for some data sets. Um, you know, us, us sort of crafting these things as much as we can to figure out what works best is, to me, a better strategy than just let the machine figure it out. Although that is not a bad strategy, um, I'd rather know what's going on in the data set. So I, I usually spend a lot of time doing plots like this and figuring out, well, how should I represent my data? And, and a lot of that will be facilitated by the package that we're going to show. Okay? So, uh, so there are some links in here. Uh, it's kind of weird to see on here. Um, we're writing another book, and we're about halfway through it. And so the nice thing about it is we have an HTML version we released. Um, so there are links in here, like when we're talking about pre-processing categorical predictors, we have a whole chapter on that. So th when you see the links there to this book down version of a, a book that we're in the process of writing. Um, I wanted to pull this part out because it's another good example. There's a lot of variety of things you can do with categorical predictors, and it's another good example of how to do pre-processing, and this is where we'll start to do, introduce like simple recipes. Okay, so let's actually take the real data set. Um, what I'm gonna do is um, load the package and um, it basically, whenever you run this make aims function, it, it uses uh, dplyr and a bunch of other stuff to make on the fly the version, the process version of this data set. Um, and there's a little under 3,000 properties in there. So let's just do that real quick. Don't tell Hadley, but I have a bunch of like theme black and white things that I do. He knows. Um, so where was I here, right? So about slide 13. So when I do this, it works really fast. It basically creates um, this, uh, this AIMS data set. When I look at it, there's a bunch of predictors. There's longitude and latitude, and here's sale price in thousands. Um, and uh, actually, you know what? I didn't take the quality ones out of here. That's not the end of the world. Uh, but you can see there's um, some predictors you find some of them like overall quality that have like 10 levels. You can see there's a lot of factors in this data set. And sometimes I have like two, two or so values. Other times they have like neighborhood has like um, uh, sub M S subclass. I'm not sure what that is, but it's a descriptor of the house. That is like 16 levels. So there's a lot of qualitative data in, data in here. Um, and as I'll show you in a minute, some of these, the distribution of these is not necessarily uniform. There are some neighborhoods that are well represented and some that aren't. So there are some aspects of the, the qualitative variables that are worth looking at here. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm also going to do a, a split into the training and test set. And, um, and again, the terminology here, the training set would be the data set we're going to use to fit models and do, try out pre-processing and do some other things. The test set we save to the very end until we uh, want to look at performance. Yeah, Nick. 
So the, the package, you can get the raw data, and that's what it keeps. So if you want to actually look and see, like, what is he doing, um, if you want to see a bunch of, like, tidyverse code, you can look at this and see all the translations. Like, you know, it's not, it just keeps going and going and going. So, um, so yeah. Instead of just having, like, here's the finished product, you can go and look and see what's going on. So with our sample, um, it's a, what we can do is we can do a really simple split. And you'll see more of our sample in a little bit. I'm going to set the seed so we'll all get the same split. And then when I get this data split object, it basically has in it embedded what the split should be. Um, so this hasn't really split the data yet. It's kind of those, the training and test set are sort of like contained in this. But there's little accessor functions that if I, in the split, object, if I want to get the data that's allocated for training, um, there's an implicit, you know, p equal to 0.75. So 75% goes into training by default, 25% goes into testing. Of course, you can change that if you want. Um, another aspect of this is it stratifies by sale price, since that's a pretty skewed distribution. And it has some algorithms in it that uh, sample, make that training test set random sample um, done in a way that preserves the distribution of the outcome. So if you're wondering what that's about. Uh, but what I get when I run these two functions is I basically get um, a training set that's a, a tibble. I believe it's a tibble. Yeah, it's a tibble. Um, when I print this split object out, I see this little notation here. Um, what this means, and you'll see a little bit more in a bit, um, it's a total amount of data in the original data set, how much went into training and how much went into testing. So if I look at my number of rows in my training set, it should be 2199. And lo and behold, it is. So basically, all I've done here is I've separated my data set out. The training set's the majority of it. And that's where I'm going to play around and look at different feature engineering methods and transformation methods and so on. And that's what I'll use with my model. And then if I had a bunch of different contending models I was trying to choose between, hopefully I'd work that out before I got to the test set. But at the very end, your test set is what you use to basically estimate performance at the very end. Um, you know, people. Um, this, I was going to say argue, but discuss this with me a lot. Like, you know, maybe that's not the best approach. Why would you waste data on a test set? And, and I can uh, talk about that a lot more. But it, it boils down to good scientific practice. It's, it's a really good idea. Resampling goes a long way, but it's a really good idea to have some data reserved at the very end to just be an unbiased assessment of how your model worked. It, it sometimes you can do resampling wrong, and I've done it. So, um, so anyway, we we're going to work with this training set uh, for the most part uh, in the notes. So the first thing we might think about doing for most of these columns that we, we're going to, so I'm going to fit a bunch of like linear regression models and then a k nearest neighbor model at the end. I'm not going to do anything terribly fancy here. Um, but those models both require numerical representations of everything. So if you're using like random forest and I have like on the next slide or something uh, a subset of the, the functions to do this, but there are some functions that even when you use the formula method, um, they don't produce dummy variables. So if you use any of the random forest functions, uh, the boosting functions, XGBoost doesn't do this, but um, what those other packages will do, especially for trees, is they won't actually make dummy variables from their predictors, uh, their factor predictors, because they have the ability of processing the data as character and, and splitting data. Like, you know, um, trees can make a split that say, I want no alley or grava alley on this side of the split and paved alley on this side. Uh, but for almost every other model, we do need to convert our, um, our factor predictors to something numeric. And, you know, and the, the straightforward thing to do is just use dummy variables or indicator variables. And basically, um, if you have, you know, three levels of your factor, you end up producing, you know, three minus one uh, dummy variables. So, again, if I have, like, a neighborhood has 19 different values, we'd produce 18 dummy variables. And, again, the reason we do that is redundancy. If you know the first 18 of them, you can figure out what the last neighborhood is. So, not, you know, from a common sense standpoint, you don't need all 19. From a mathematical standpoint, you don't want to induce any sort of linear dependencies in your design matrix if you're a statistician. So that's what we tend to do. Uh, recipes can do it both ways, or sometimes you want to generate the full set. But we follow the basic convention in R that we take the first level of the factor, which in this case is gravel, and we don't generate a dummy variable for that, but we generate dummy variables for the other, um, other um, levels. They get their own columns that are one when the actual data has that value and zero otherwise. It's pretty straightforward stuff, right? Um, if you have ordered factors, it's a little more complex. They, they typically do polynomial functions. So if you have like uh, an or like high, medium, low ordinal value, it'll, it'll do a numeric, a non-binary 
encoding of your data that has a linear term, like it's a contrast function that has like estimates a linear term, and another one, let's see if you have three levels, it can also do a quadratic. Um, I hate that. I think it's like the worst idea in the world. Like if I have like month as a predictor, I have 12 values, I don't need an 11 order polynomial. That's just like a bad idea. I know there's the whole polynomial neural network thing going on right now, but um, that just seems awful to me. Um, but you, you can do that with or without either in, in basic R or in recipes. Um, and if we were fitting this like an LM, this would just happen automatically, right? And we'll talk about this in a second. You, you do LM and do sale price, tilde, and neighborhood, and it automatically makes dummy variables for you. And so then it follows this convention. It generates like, you know, n minus one of them. If they're ordered, it does this polynomial bit. Except, you know, this, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it, here's examples of cases where it doesn't do that. So I usually, for care, get like four or five like stack overflow questions a year about like where are my dummy variables. Um, and it's because there's some R functions just don't do that for good reason. So here's a question, you know, what happens when you have a, a predictor that has a lot of categories in it um, and maybe those categories are not distributed uniformly? So if you're doing like text mining, you know, you might have like um, a row in your data set that's a bunch of text. And what people will do is they'll cut up that text into words and then they'll have like either counts or indicators for all those words. So if you think about text, that could be thousands and thousands of basically indicator variables that are mostly zero, right? So, you know, there's a whole, there's a lot of study about ways to deal with this. Um, here's an example in the data set we're using. If you look at neighborhood, there's a ton of people in North Ames and in College Creek, but there's almost nobody in Landmark and in Green Hills in this data set. Um, so, you know, if we were doing this, you know, if you split your data into training and test, and you happen to get Landmark in your training set, then you'll get like an indicator with maybe one, a single one in it, but your test set is all zeros, or even worse, if you don't get any landmark in your training set, then it's, it's all zeros, assuming it knows that that factor level's there. So, you know, this can cause some problems periodically, um, depending on how you represent your data. Um, the tidyverse tends to want to not use factors in data sets, and that's, uh, I viscerally disagree with that, but I'm not boss. Um, but recipes will spend a lot of time converting your data to factors because when you do modeling, there's really good reasons. Like with dummy variables, you want to know, the thing about factors is it tells you all the possible levels at the time you ran your model. And you know, if you had just character data, it wouldn't have that embedded into the object. So factors are probably a good idea. So how would we deal with this? Um, one thing you can do is you can just filter out things. You can just do dummy variables and filter out the ones that either are all zero or mostly zero. So there's filters you could do. You could, after you generate the dummy variables, you can have a step during your design matrix creation where you say, you know what, look and see if there's anything that's all zeros and just get rid of those so linear regression doesn't yell at me. Or you can do these things that we call near zero variance predictors where, you know, if you have a single one in a column out of a thousand rows, that's not zero variance, but it's pretty close. And so we have some algorithms you could use to sort of detect when that happens and get rid of those. Um, another thing you can do is, um, excuse me, is um, you can come up with an other category. So you might say, well, look, if, if something has less than, let's say, 1% of its training set data is represented in that factor level, let's take all those levels and just put them as other, right? Let's just pull them together. And maybe that makes sense or maybe it doesn't. Like those wouldn't necessarily be geographically next to each other in this data set. But that's probably a better idea than just leaving them as is. Um, and so that's a strategy you can use, is you can just say, you know, come up with some threshold to say, you know what, I'm gonna change the factor levels before it gets to the model, and then, um, you know, it still will have North Ames and College Creek, but a lot of those factor levels will disappear and get lumped to in another column. And so the reason I'm going through this without showing any R code right away is, um, I have like two or three blog posts about this um, on the RStudio blog is, it's really almost impossible to do any of this with model.matrix. So model.matrix is a, in the formula method itself in R is an amazing thing and I think it's like, if I were to like try to estimate how much of R has, you know, the features in R that have made R so resilient and survived, I'd say the model, the formula method's up there, right? If it's, it's in the top three, right? So that's just such a simple and easy way of, of representing the terms in your model, it's a really great thing. But when you're going to do something that's not really simple, like making an other category, you just can't do these things. You can do some things on an individual predictor basis that make your life easier. Like if you want to use splines and things like that, um, you can do that with the formula method. But once you get beyond there, you're really kind of stuck. And, and that was sort of like the impetus of recipes is, um, recipes is kind of like taking the formula method and dplyr and mash them together. Um, it allows you to do a lot more than what you can do in the formula method. And this is a good example that, um, that if you were to try to write some, some code to do this with the standard R 
infrastructure would be very, very difficult to do. Or another example is imputation. So when you, when you develop imputation over a column, you're basically building a model for that column that takes all the other columns as predictors and tries to predict the missing values. Right? That's difficult to do in the formula method, like embedding, like, let's say, a, a Kinnear's neighbor or a bag tree model inside of your formula method is not something I would suggest doing. Um, and so the whole idea behind recipes is let's, let's think about this a little bit more now that we can do and know a lot more what we want to do with data, even for something like a linear model, not some fancy machine learning method. We're kind of, we have to do these things outside the formula method, which is a giant pain. And so that's, recipes is sort of designed to be a, a substitute for that. Um, some things I'm working on right now I just thought I'd show, uh, they're in an R package right now. Um, different people handle this differently. Um, there's this thing called effect or likelihood encodings. I'm not convinced that this is a good idea, but it, a lot of times I end up like, like maybe like 10% of carrot is things I implemented just to show people not to do it. Um, and this may or may not fall in that category. So what people would do is, um, for like these effect encoding methods, is they would take, let's say, all the neighborhoods and represent those, let's say, I think there's 19 neighborhoods, in a single numeric column. And the values of that numeric column would be basically the average value of the outcome for that factor level. So if we were doing this for our sale price data, what we would do is for every neighborhood, we would estimate, let's say, the mean sale price and then every time we see that neighborhood in our, in our data set, that, that new column we're going to use instead of the factor level just has that mean effect in it, right? So then you end up having this, like, you know, this numeric column that represents a single uh, factor column instead of using dummy variables. And so and you can do that using, like, the way I've implemented right now is using, like, Stan and Bayesian models because it does a lot of shrinkage and does some smart things. You can use Glimnet or just like a linear or logist or a mixed model. There's all sorts of ways to do it. If you did it for this data set, here's what the encoding looks like is, um, you know, the one that was most prevalent, which um, North Ames, is sort of like middle of the road in terms of sale prices. So that would be encoded as, you know, what is it, four to the five point something here. And the value of that new encoding predictor would have the highest value in Northridge where the sale prices are the highest. And, down here near the airport and the railroad um, for the lowest. Uh, one thing you can do there that's kind of cool is when you get new values of, like somebody, you know, there's a new neighborhood they develop and you want to use your model. That neighborhood's not in your original model, so you'd have to, like, rebuild your model. With this type of encoding, you can estimate basically based off the, the, you know, the center of the posterior and say, okay, when we get a new, um, a new house, our most likely estimate of its effect is the center of the posterior. So, the nice thing about this is um, you can encode this for new houses or new neighborhoods. Um, but I, I don't know, it seems like a bad idea to take a model, make a predictor that has the outcome of the model, and then put that in the model. That seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so the, the thing I say is if you're going to do that, just resample the crap out of that to make sure. You know, the, part of the problem with overfitting is never giving the model any access to any data that would contradict something you've done to your data. And this is like a prime example of that. So you would want to really validate this process of, of doing this. Um, anyway, so that's one thing you could do with recipes in this other package. Um, is there a question? Uh, doesn't that also, the independence of the observations now, because all the observations that have to be in, you know, more things now have to be in the average. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some statistical things going on there. Uh, let me make it worse, though. So deep learning people. They have these things called like entity and word embeddings. And in a way, it's, it's a sensible thing to do in a way. So, you know, the, the idea there is they're going to have like, you know, for text models, they're going to have like millions of indicator variables for words and things like that. And so what they developed is they developed some like layers in a neural network that can basically optimize. They, they think they're doing PCA, but they're really not. What they, but they're, they're doing is saying like, let's take those thousands of indicator variables and represent them in a smaller subspace, like PCA would do. But that's where the similarity ends, like there's no PCA going on here. But they call these like embedding methods. So they say, let's take those thousands of indicators and embed them into three new numeric columns. And then they, with a neural network, you can, you can do that. And it actually does some interesting things. There's not much been published peer reviewed. There's tons of blog posts on this. Um, but basically what happens is if you want to embed, you know, these thousands of variables into three new variables, um, you take these coefficients of the variables and when you get a new uh, text phrase, you map it to those, the combinations of those three um, sets of coefficients that you would get. So it, it's not terribly unlike the effect 
um, estimate encoding. It's just done in a nonlinear neural network way. Um, so you can do that, and, and again, that's in, that's in a, another package called Embed um, that I've been working, it's not in CRAN yet. Um, I know I keep talking about these things without showing you code, but we're getting there in a minute. Um, I, I basically want to go through the things that you would want to do that the formula method can't really do. Um, and there's lots of other things you can do with categorical predictors. There's like this feature hashing approach and things like that. So there's a lot, especially for this data set, you might think about doing with these variables instead of just doing indicator variables. Okay, so that's just like a survey of like categorical predictors. What could we do with those? So let's get into the actual like R code here. Okay. So again, recipe is a is a methodology to produce like a design matrix. So when you think about like old school statistics, like you know I'm kind of like traditional statistician. And you think about like your X matrix and your Y matrix, and you know my my. Um, my vintage of statistician that is me, we, we used to call that a design matrix because we used to take actual experimental design classes. Um, and so like when you look at what model.matrix does, a lot of, most of what it does is making the design matrix. It's taking, it's taking that formula in your original data frame and converting that into a numeric metric or matrix that then LM can use or LM.fit can use. And so if you think about like just fitting um, uh, a model that just had longitude and latitude in the model, and you, you did that, just put that in LM, it's gonna do a sequence of things. Um, like we inline, if we just use LM on this formula here, well the first thing we do is we inline log transform, log 10 transform sale price. And that makes sense, because it's skewed and we don't wanna predict any like cheap houses being negative, right? So that, that prevents us from doing that. Um, so that's one thing it would do. The, the second thing it would do is really assign you know, sale price is the outcome that's on the left-hand side of that um, tilde, and then you have longitude and latitude, it says those are the predictors. So one thing the formula matrix does is it defines the roles of these variables that you've listed from your data set. And then the third thing it, um, well, actually that's the first two things, and the third thing it would do then is log your data. And if you had a subset command, it would do filtering and some other things like that. But basically, you know, if you look at what I just described, it's basically like a series of instructions like assign this to the outcome, assign these to the predictors, and log that, right? So it's a series of steps. And so when we were, <laughs> we were sitting around brainstorming this, I was like, all right, what's a good like, um, analogy we can use here? And I'm very food-oriented, and so I was like, a recipe, right? Because you, know, you think about like you get a book of recipes, that's not the actual food, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an algorithm, it's a description of what you want to do. And then when you go to, to make some food from a recipe, you look at that blueprint, you take your ingredients, and you do what it says to do. And that's basically what model.matrix is doing. It's basically a specification of what you want to do. Now, where the problem with model.matrix is it doesn't, it doesn't separate the specification of what you want to do from the actual doing of it, right? So that's, to me, one of the biggest problems is with model.matrix is it doesn't separate um, the actual execution from the specification. And, and if we do manage to do that, that opens up a lot of doors for what we can do. So a simple recipe that would sort of emulate what LM would do under the hood with that particular formula would look like this. As you load the recipes package, we're using, a we're using a formula here. You don't have to use a formula to specify the roles of variables, but the first thing you do is when you create the recipe is you can give it uh, you know, Y tilde X type of thing, and, and that says sale price is the outcome, longitude is a predictor, and latitude is a predictor. You'll get them from this data set. And then what you can do is you can add steps to that process using the pipe. And you can say step log, which says log the variables, in this case a single variable that I have listed here. And that does basically the same thing. Okay, now you might say, well, that's a lot more typing than I would do otherwise. Um, for LM, but as you'll see in a little bit, much like with dplyr and ggplot, we can start to string things together, um, sometimes in a different order than model.matrix would do them, because sometimes we want to do that. So, and so at this point, all we've done is we've specified the recipe. We haven't actually done anything. And in fact, you don't even need to give it the real data set. The only th thing it uses that data set for in this particular call is to figure out what's a factor, are the names in the formula that you gave me, the right names are in the, the actual data and so on. You can give it like the first five um, values of that data set and it can still do the same thing. So at this point all we've done is say, look, our specification, what we want to do is we want to declare this one thing as the outcome, declare these two things as predictors, and oh yeah, you're actually going to calculate the outcome as the log, log 10 of the actual value, which is the same thing the formula method would have done. Yes? Yes. Not unless it has to. So the question is, like, 
to paraphrase a little bit, like how much does the recipe save about the data? So here's a good example of this is, and I have this in the blog post, is it, it's really sensible what the formula method does. So any, you know, the formula method, anything could be on this side of the, of this side of the equation. It could have interactions and nesting and all sorts of relationships in between the predictors. And one thing it does is it saves this um, one object. It's a big matrix and it, it has like, if you have P predictors or P columns in your data set, it's P by P plus one, I think. And it's mostly zero. And that, one of the things that does is it maps the relationships of what things are involved in interactions and so on. But the thing is, if you have a lot of predictors, that becomes a really, really inefficient way to represent what's in the formula. And so, um, and because of that, I have examples where like you can fit a random force model and you know, based on some logging I put in there, you can spend like 40% of your time just creating the model matrix compared to how much time random force actually executes on the function, right? So that can be enormously inefficient. And, and in designing recipes, it's not as high performance as I want it to be right now, but we save only the parts of the data and those relationships that we really need. So we've tried to, we want to, we will save everything we'll need, but we don't save everything that we might ever possibly need. So for example, when I do interactions here, we do it in a way where you don't have to save that big matrix. Um, we, we encode things behind the scenes in a way that allows us to have a more efficient representation of things. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So anyway, we haven't really executed anything. This is kind of like, making a ggplot and saving it to an object, right? We've written down what we want to do, but we haven't actually done anything yet. And so um, down here maybe is a good place to start. Here's the baking analogy or the cooking analogy is when you define a recipe, that's all you're doing is you're making a definition of something, a specification. And then you, you might need to estimate something. So if you're estimating a transformation or if you're doing dummy variables, at that point what you're doing is you're taking the actual data that you want to use in either um, estimating parameters or figuring out what the factor levels are or what the interactions are and so on. And so we call that preparing the recipe, right? So at that point what you're doing is you're doing all the computations um, without actually applying it to a new data set. Right? So at that point, that second stage of preparing the recipe is where you're doing all the estimation bits. And then the third part is when you're basically applying that to data sets. So there's a function called bake, uh, which is basically when you want to take your, your, um, your recipe where you've done all the estimation and apply that to a data set. We have another function, which I'm proud of the name, called juice, um, which kind of does the same thing, in, in, but it's more efficient in, in some cases, and I'll go through that in just a minute. So basically, the recipe is the specification. The prep or the preparing of the recipe is where you do the estimation and baking and juicing is the analogy of like kind of like, like predict almost, but in, instead of predicting an outcome, you're generating the columns of your new data set on any input data set that you want to push through there, okay? So let's say we want to do the same thing we were doing before. So here's our initial recipe that we, we just showed. I'm going to add neighborhood in here as a predictor, and then I just want to collapse uh, neighborhoods that are less than 5% of the, the training set into an other category. So what I'm doing is I'm using a step called other, I'm saying do that on the neighborhood predictor, and again, if the frequency in the training set is less than 5%, any of those neighborhoods that are less than 5% of the total, it will figure that out, lump those into an other, it will change the factor level of that variable, and then when it, if and when you go to do any dummy variables, it will know the proper dummy variables to do. So then, you know, there's a pipe at the end of that. So a third step I've added here is to create dummy variables. Um, we don't do that automatically for factors. Um, you have to do that, and there's good reasons not to automatically do that. Um, there's, the syntax a little bit different here is instead of saying neighborhood or sale price like I would in a dplyr call or something like that, I have this thing that says all nominal. And so the thing about dplyr is you have like starts with or matches, you know, and things like that, these selectors. But you know, I realize in recipes, you're going to want to select things maybe based on their role, like, hey, do this for all the predictors, or do this for all the continuous values in the data set. So we have an additional sort of set of predictor or of selectors, like all nominal, which says, hey, do this to all the things that are factor or, or character variables in my data set. And you'll see more of those selectors as we go on. So it's sort of like an enhanced version of the things you can use to capture variables in your data set. You can still use all the original dplyr selectors. 
So like if I want to do like con or, um, contained sepal, I can still do that here. But I have a, another set that I can use that are more relevant for the, the context in which I'll use them. So again, at this point, it's the same recipe I had before, except where I'm going to do a little bit with the neighborhood predictor and then convert neighborhood. In this case, neighborhood is the only factor variable that's on that side of the equation. So I'm going to take all the nominal variables, which is that one, and convert that to dummy variables. So you know, when you asked about how much do we save here, for this particular recipe, the only thing we've done is we've resaved the factor levels for neighborhood in that second step. Um, or we will do that when we, we prep the recipe. So it not only took the factor levels we have, but it, it knows to redefine them. And then when it goes to use a dummy variable, it knows how to encode those. So it knows what the reference value is and, and that sort of thing. So we, don't, we only save things when we need them, basically. Yes? Yes. And the reason for this was, um, this is a weird thing to say, is you might have steps where you don't know what the variable names are. You, you might not know what variables are there. So you can run filters in, in recipes. You can have a filter that may eliminate columns. So how do you write subsequent steps if you don't know that that column is there? Or like if you convert your data principal components, you might, if you say, hey, give me enough principal components to capture 95% of the variance, you don't know how many of those are. So, you know, so something like starts with PC would capture those variables. So it, it quickly dawned on me that I was going to have to have extra selectors in here because I'm making decisions about variables that don't exist yet, um, which is, you know, potentially problematic. So at this point, again, all I've done is, is I've just said, you know, when you go to do this with the real data, here's some extra steps to our, our set of instructions, okay? So then um, we want to actually do the estimation. And the only estimation that's involved here is getting the, the frequencies of neighborhood and figure out what goes in others. So we're not like computing any slopes or intercepts, but it really is an actual estimation procedure here. Um, that's really the only thing that happens here. So when I, when I train my recipe, basically when I prepare it, I give it the recipe, I give it the actual data set to, to use for estimation. And, and that's the basic required syntax at this point, is you can just do this and it will, it will execute everything it needs to. I have two other things on here. Um, I'll sort of verbose, which tells you as it executes, you know, what's happening. Um, the retain bit is, is kind of important. I might end up defaulting this to be true, but right now it's false. So when you prepare the, the recipe, you're going to go through each step. So you're going to start off with your original AIMS trained data set. You're going to take only the, the variables that you've defined the formula. So that's what it, the first thing it does is says, okay, I'm just going to take the ones that I know I'm going to need. And then when it goes to do step other, it estimates what should be lumped into the other category. But then what it immediately does is it applies that to the training set. So every step has to, every step that you get has to already have applied previous steps so everything works correctly. Right, so for your training set, it's going to actually do all the estimation and apply those operations as it goes because you, you don't want to not, um, you know, if you like have a filter, you don't want to, you have to keep applying that so the variables you have in the third or fourth or fifth step have been processed the way the first step wants them. So in the process of preparing your recipe, it's actually executing all this on the training set. But that training set might be really, really big. And so by default, all it does is um, it gets rid of that training set at the very end because that's just potentially a big footprint. So using retain equal true says, you know what, hold on to the training set because I'm going to use it later. And it keeps that processed version of the training set around so you don't have to re-execute all those calculations because you've already done them in the process of preparing your recipe. So this, it's a little bit subtle. I mean, does it make sense that all my estimation steps have to take the data you have to execute those as soon as you estimate them so the step after them is appropriate. It's consistent with what's going to happen like in the wild. Okay? And again, if you don't use retain equal true, it saves space by just getting rid of that potentially big data set that you came up with. Yes? I'm sorry, I was on the wrong slide. It's, it's here when you prepare it. Yeah. So again, like when you define the recipe, this, this, this could be one row of your data set if you don't want to give it the whole thing. But when you actually go to do all your estimation, the, the training data you give it has to be the thing you want it to estimate on. Okay. All right. So if I print it out, um, one thing it does here, um, so let me actually execute this.
So one thing to notice here is, oops, I guess I should load the library. So you know, I have all nominal here, the dummy variable. So when, in the process of preparing the recipe, it figures out what variables those actually are, because it's actually executing as it goes. So when I print this out, so when I prepare it, and then if, when I print out the recipe, um, instead of it saying all nominal, it says neighborhood, because it resolves them. So if you want to see what variables it actually used, instead of saying, give me all the nominal ones, once you prepare the recipe, those are all listed there. Um, now, you might want to interrogate this a little bit, and this comes up a little bit later, but in the sort of broom fashion, we have tidy methods that if you want to say, like, you know, hey, what variables were collapsed into neighborhood? Like, or what are my actual le levels in neighborhood now? You can say for the second step, which was the factor collapsing, um, you can run the tidy method on that and see what the surviving neighborhoods are. So if you want to get down and get like slopes and intercepts or anything it estimates, you can get that using tidy methods. So we started off with, I think, 19 neighborhoods and we're down to eight, just based on the, the threshold that I picked. All right, so now that we've estimated it, you know, maybe we want to fit a model in this. So we want to get the actual process version of the data back. So the general way of doing that is to run this bake command. And, and again, bake is like, you know, let's actually do this. Um, and it basically takes our recipe that we've trained already and then uh, or prepared, and then whatever data set you want to apply that, those operations to. In this case, I'll do it for the test set. And when I do that, um, you know, I save it. I say Ames test dummies is the version with the, the dummy uh, variables. And when I look at that, what I get back is all the variables that I start off with in the formula. And then you can see um, it does sensible naming. So like I've tried to like get rid of all the things I hate about model.matrix, which is like factor with the level smashed up against it. You can change actually what you want the delimiter to be. So I use underbars. So it'll be the, uh, by default, it will be the variable name underbar the factor levels. And so you see I have like neighborhood, old town, um, you know, there's Sawyer and Northridge Heights. And then here's the other, which would be one for all the, the other um, neighborhoods that aren't included in this list. So the thing is like it's going to go through iteratively through the recipe and do all the applications that you estimated in the recipe and apply them to the data set. But as I mentioned before, if you just want to get things back for the training set, why would you go to the trouble to re-execute all those things? And that's what the juice function does. It's kind of like bake, but if you just want to get the training set data back, you can just get that back because you've stored it by saying retain equal true. So if I just run like juice on this, it's the same, you know, it's the same structure, it's the same variables, but now you're looking at the, you know, about 2,200 variable or data points that were in the original uh, training set. I, I could very well do this. I could say, you know, uh, I could, I'm sorry, um, do that on the training set and get exactly the same thing back, but it's less efficient by doing that because it's doing calculations that have already happened. Okay, so that's the, the nice thing about that. Yes? Oh, uh, wait, what, that, we were over there first. Go ahead. So it doesn't re-estimate anything besides the training set. So we, we compartmentalize all the estimation steps happen on the training set. So for example, if you do PCA, all the loadings and all that get estimated from the training set and get applied to the, the test data set or any other data that you throw at it. No, you do get that. Um, so here's a test set. And so you can see neighborhood other. So what it's going to take is going to take all the input columns. And that other bit is basically like an if else. It says if, you know, from, from the training set, it estimates which neighborhoods get collapsed into other. And so then when you get the test data set or any other data set, it goes through that same if else and says, well, in the test data, if I get any of these neighborhoods, now make them other. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's important because, um, and this comes up in a lot of machine learning competitions, it's easy to have what they call information leakage. It's easy to say, you know, let's take data we're going to make predictions on that aren't the training set and use that data to make better predictions. But that's like, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Like, you know, I, somebody wrote a blog post on how they use Carrot to like win a machine learning competition. And what they did is they, they took the training set and they knew what the test set predictors were and they calculated similarity between the two and took only the training sets that were as similar as possible to the test set. And they did great, right? And that's maybe not surprising, but like, you know, any other data set, that's going to be awful. And so, you know, we, we try to minimize, because it's easy to maybe unconsciously do that. Um, or, or, or have some pre-processing methods, and we have examples of that in the book, where you think, oh, we should just do it this way, but you end up using the, t the test set in the process. So the nice thing about recipes is it, it really um, isolates the data used for estimation. So it's, it makes it difficult to do that accidentally. Yeah. Uh, there was a question back there. That's a great question. Uh, you can, but you... Uh, so the question is, like, you know, you log 10 outcome, what, if, what happens when I want to back transform it? Um, so right now there's a step that will do that, but it doesn't happen automatically. So that, that's been the biggest request I have, and if there's anything that changes the API a little bit going forward, it will be that. So people might center and scale their predictors, but at some point in the rest of me, they might want to uncenter and scale to get back to the original units. The difficulty programmatically is um, each step happens individually. So it deliberately has no knowledge of what happened before it. It gets the data that has those applied to it, but it doesn't look back and say, oh yeah, in step two I did this other thing, right? So what I would need to do to untransform things is, is build something in the recipes that will allow you to go back and say, hey, undo this thing we did before. And that's not set up in there right now. Um, that's probably the one major thing I'm going to work on next. Another thing that would sort of complement what you're doing here is, um, or what you asked about is, um, there's no reason we couldn't include like dplyr steps, like step mutate or step filter. Some of that stuff is already in here in, in specific ways, but, but if you wanted to unlog things, you know, you could have a general like step that allows you to basically do the same thing you would do with mutate and then exponentiate it. So right now it's not quite there. But we know about that, and it's a little bit difficult to do that stuff, but we know we need to do it. So, yeah. Uh, yes? Is there a way to make neighborhood other the zero case in your dummy coding? Is that there? feels like a really yeah. unintuitive way to look at it. Uh, is yeah. there? I, I want to say there is, but I did that a long time ago. Uh, step other. Um, Uh, it's not in step other, but I have all these like maintenance steps, like there might be one in there to switch the factor levels. So you might, you might be able to do that, I think you can do that with a different step. Yeah, yeah. If you look around and find that, or don't find that, let me know. That would be an easy thing to do. Um, and I do that in some other areas, so I know it's in there somewhere, whether it's its own step or not. But that's a good point. Um, that might be a good option here to say, you know, keep his first level or something like that. That would make a lot of sense. Go ahead. Is there an argument to be able to use actually pipes that data split objects? Because now you, you take your data split and you say, okay, you go with your training and you do a step log and all this information. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know what you mean by data split object. Oh, oh, so yeah, I want to talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. Yes? Can you explain the difference between bake and juice? Yeah, so bake is um, applying the same preprocessing to any arbitrary data set, like a training set, test set, or whatever. Juice you can only use when you've retained the original data set, and it only works for the training set. So it's only just like, give me that slot in the recipe that kept my training set that's already been preprocessed. So it would be equivalent to do... Uh, this, so baking the training set, that would be equivalent to doing that. So it's saying, just give me the original training set that's already been processed from the recipe.
Yeah, I'm getting to that part. Yeah. So let's say I don't retain it, and then I go to, um, I, like just, I just like saying juice, juice the recipe. Uh, sounds so healthy. Um, it's not going to work because it says you didn't retain it. So there's two reasons to maybe retain. One would be to get access to that data. The other one I'll talk about in just a second. Yeah. Sure. They're estimated from the training data. They can be applied to any data set, right? So, you know, I, I have models, probably they're still at, in Pfizer where we're using like carrot stuff. It's a, and there's a, some, something similar in carrot to this where, you know, we're still getting new data points like that aren't in the test set. They just need to get predictions on them. And so, you know, it's gonna, it would then take all that pre-processing that was estimated and just apply those things to whatever data point that comes up next. So that's, bake is, bake is almost always what you use unless you're just putting it into the training set. So um, because then you'd be using your test set to define the pre-processing, which you don't want to do. Yeah. Well, but if you're doing imputation and things like that, so let's say you do like, so if it's centering scaling or something innocuous, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Uh, or dummy variables or something like that. But, but a lot of these steps, it would, it would basically overfit or potentially overfit. Like that effect, that effect encoding thing, right? It would be basically replacing our, our test data with the outcome of the test data, which is gonna do great in your model, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right, right. Nor would you want to, but yeah. But you actually can, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, so, um, oh, so one other thing about this is uh, let's say you just want to get the predictors back. Then you can put this, by default, it gives you the dplyr everything here, right? So you get all the, oh, darn it. Um, I deserve that. Um, so by default, it gives you everything back. But let's say you just want to get uh, if I just want to get the neighborhood variables back. So you can append selectors on here um, to get just back the, if you just want the outcome or the predictors. So again, if you're going to do predictions on your new data set, you only have the predictors. So everything would give that back to you. But if you have the outcome in your test set and you only want the predictors, you can do whatever selectors here. One other thing I'll mention, I think it comes up in the notes in a little bit, is there's an option called composition. It's a horribly named option, but you can say give that to me in a matrix or give it to me in a sparse matrix or a data frame. If you don't want to tibble back, you can say, you know, give it to me in these formats. So there's more you can do here. Um, yes. It does simplify some things that you could do, you know, so far you can do all this in dplyr. Well, dummy variables would be kind of weird, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about interaction effects. So that's one place where the interface is a little bit different. Um, well, let's first talk about what interactions are. Um, so here's an example where I plotted the, the sale price of the house on log 10 scale versus I don't know why I logged it. It looks the same if you unlog it, uh, but the year built. Um, and it's almost, it's arguably whether it's quadratic or not. I mean, it definitely comes down as the year goes down. And there's not that much data in the tail, so maybe that little uptick is, is noise. Um, but you get this relationship if you just look at that predictor versus the outcome. But if you separate it by whether the house has air conditioning or not, and if it doesn't have air conditioning, it doesn't really matter what the, the year built was. Right? Maybe a little bit decreasing there, but not by much. But you basically see the similar, the same pattern for data or for houses that do have air conditioning. So this is maybe a little bit atypical example, but clearly the trends are different between um, the year built and whether or not you have air conditioning. 
Um, the sample sizes are very different, but I, I think it's pretty arguable that this is not an increasing function. Um, and so this is an example of an interaction, that this is clearly different patterns, and you might want to put this in your linear model to see if that's a good idea or not. And the way we would do that historically would be we would create like two linear models, let's say if we want to test for interactions, one that just has the two predictors, and then the way you specify interactions, you don't need a space here. Um, you would put the colon between the two things you want to interact, and then you could do the ANOVA method and see if the interaction which is significant, which in this case it is. Um, but the operable point here is if you're doing interactions, um, you would take the uh, variables that you want to interact and put a colon between them. Now, central layer here's a factor. It's yes or no. It's Y or N. So again, what the, what the model.matrix does behind the scenes is it converts that to a dummy variable, and then and it has one level, so you get one indicator vector back, and that, inter, that interaction is just multiplying the year built times that indicator. But let's say air conditioning had like yes, no, or unknown. Then you get two dummy variables back. And what model.matrix would do, it would give you two interaction columns where it would multiply the year built by both those indicator variables. Okay, so that's what's happening in basic model.matrix. But if you think about it, that's an interesting question for recipes is, well, if I do interactions, I don't, like, model matrix figures that out, but like, how do I, how do I tell it to do interactions between all the dummy variables? Right, so if I use step dummy to create those indicator vari variables, and I want to do interactions against that, I don't know what their names are necessarily. I don't know how many of them there are. I mean, I, if I look at my data, I know, but programmatically, it doesn't know at that point. And so the way we solve that is being able to use selectors and interactions. So you can say, create dummy variables from, central, um, from the central error uh, indicator, and whether it generates 3 or 4 or 17, um, when you use an, um, a selector in the interaction, it says, okay, anything that would have been generated as dummy variables for central error make interactions with this other variable. So you can do the same sort of thing that you did before. And here it's simple because it's just one indicator that comes back. But again, if it were neighborhood or something like that and you use step other, you really don't know how many you're going to get. And so you can use a selector like starts with to actually make that specification. The only other weird thing here is, and there's good reason for this, I hate it, is all the other selectors, you just give it the variables or some, you know, all the other steps take some selector or some variable name. Here you have to use a formula. You have to use a tilde in front. Uh, there's just like no way around that. And it bothered me for like two weeks. I tried everything. I had the whole tidyverse team on it. Um, but no, that's, that's, you know, so any, it'll yell at you if you don't do that. But, but what you can do is if you have multiple interactions, you could say, you know, this plus and then have any other interactions. Another nice thing that, um, that you can do in model.matrix is you can have a formula that's like, you know, y tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3. And then what that does is it does all the two-way interactions between those three variables, and it does the single three-way interaction. That's what that hat, you know, three is. And so you can use that same syntax with selectors when you do the interaction. So it, it has, it can figure that out. Um, and it would only save columns for the interactions. So if you did like, um, if you did that in, um, if you had like um, step interact, and then it looked like this, it would create, it knows to create um, the, the, you know, the, the three two-factor interactions and the single three-level interaction. Okay, so that, that took a lot of work, but that'll work just like it did before. And you can see, you know, I, I, I ran this and then, um, so here's, let's maybe walk through this, is here's the recipe just for this example. I log the sale price, I compute the dummy variables, and I say make it this interaction. I chain it into preparing the recipe, and I juice it to get the actual training set back. I know, that's a, quite a bit there. And then I just selected a couple rows to show, you know, remember what the interaction does, is when you, when you get that data back, again, you get the sale price and the year built, Here's the single indicator variable you get back that you generate from step dummy. And then, again, we make a sensible name out of these things. You can change it wherever you want, but the delimiter between the variables here has an underbar x underbar. So it's central error, yes, with interacting with your built. And you can see it's just a multiple, like it would be anywhere else. It's just a multiplication between the dummy variable and the, the continuous variable that creates the interaction. Okay? Make sense? All right, so that's the basics of it. You have a single data set, you just want to do some processing. Um, again, um, one thing you can do if, you know, you need to 
be able to sleep on the flight home is, um, you know, come out here to the package down site, uh, tidymiles.github.io recipes, and then um, on the reference, we try to organize the steps. Um, so there's like, you know, the selectors and things like that here, and then here are all the imputation methods we have, bagging k-nearest neighbors, you know, median mode, uh, time series imputation. If you want to do in individual transformations, whether it's log or or Box Cox or Yao Johnson, that's all organized here. Um, I hate discrete binning of data. I hate it, but you can do it because I have that, so I can show you not to do it. Um, and then there's you know you can look at all the things you can do dummy variables here. There's quite a bit you can do. Um, uh, you can convert things between dummy variables. And not them. You can convert them back to factors. You can uh, uh, unorder ordered factors and make dummy variables out. The, there's, you know, basically I went back to like every analysis I ever did and said, right, what have I done in a linear model call? And basically implemented that. So there, there's quite a bit here. Um, there's a lot of things like PCA and PLS and ratios and spatial signs. So um, there, there's there's more, way more statistical and way more involved. Um, steps. Um, there's also things that do things on rows. So, for example, if you want to lag the data, you can do that in a step. If you want to do things like um, uh, shuffle the data, like if you were at the you know the Dalek presentation, you could do a lot of recipes where you can just pick a variable to permute, basically. So there, there's quite a lot here um, to do things. All right. So when we build models, um, a lot of times we'll do resampling. So uh, uh, yes? Do you have any expectations about this? Not yet. Um, I'm, that's not my thing. So uh, we have a whole, yeah, right? Or wavelets or something like that, right? We have a whole vignette on um, creating steps. It's not that complicated to create your own steps. Um, and the only reason that it hasn't happened is I, you don't want me doing it. Like, you know, that's not my thing. Um, so somebody who has a lot of, like um, expertise in that area, it would probably be really easy to do that. Um, there's a lot of stuff that like Ron, um, Ron Hyman has about like his um, feature-based. That stuff would be great for recipes. Another example of something that maybe I'll get an intern to do next year is uh, tidy text. Right? There's a lot of workflows in tidy text that we all have that would easily make steps. You know, do like the inverse document term weighting matrix and all that. That would be. You know, that's just existing stuff that would make sense to make steps out of because it consolidates it to an actual series of, you know, recipes, or like, you know, stemming and things like that. So I, I don't, I don't want to be like recipes that just do everything, but there are so many things that, um, for reasons I'll show you in a minute, would be really advantageous to have them in here. Um, yeah. So a lot of times we build models um, when we don't have huge amounts of data. A lot of times uh, we need to evaluate, or wait a minute, that reminds me, when do we, I had an idea. Um, when is the um, coffee break? Three. Three? Six minutes? I'll talk really fast then. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we don't have a lot of data. We need to evaluate the quality of our models without going to test that. And, you know, if you've run anything that I've done, you know, the answer is resampling. And so, uh, but this, so the next part of it is to talk about how to do uh, recipes uh, with the new methods of doing resampling and at the end how you do with carrot. And, and the idea here is, um, you know, resampling, I, I try to explain this to people, um, like, is, uh, is like a box, right? There's all these things that you do in the modeling process, not just the model fit, things that you do the data that, that end up in that box, right? So if I'm going to imp do imputation, that's potentially a serious thing to do in my data, or if I'm going to convert it to PCA components or something, right? That's something before the model, but it's an, like an estimation procedure. So anything I do like that, that goes into the model, or anything post-model, like in a calibration procedure or, or something like that, that ends up in that, that box of things that we do to our training set. And so when we resample, basically, what we do is we take that box and we execute those steps. I shouldn't use steps, not in the recipe, but you know, those orders of operation. Um, when we resample that, we basically give that the um, operations inside of that box, like a slightly different version of the training set, do our estimation and everything we do, and then we make predictions on data that was not involved in that, what happened inside that box. So it's analogous to training and test set. 
And so, but the important thing to, to get across, and it's in a slide in a minute, is what, what it would be a really bad idea in some cases is to process your data with a recipe and then do the stuff inside the box with resampling and then make predictions. There are, if you're centering and scaling, you're making dummy variables, that's fine. Those things are very simple and they're not gonna drastically affect things. But if you're doing, you know, PCA or especially imputation and things like that, you definitely want to have those things inside. So what you're going to end up doing is if you do tenfold cross-validation like we're going to do in a little bit, you're going to want to execute and prep and everything in that recipe ten different times before it goes into a model. So I want to show you sort of the lower level interface to do that because probably in the next six months there will be a higher level interface to do that. Um, but we want to make sure that we don't, because it's computationally easy to just process things with recipes up front and then do cross-validation. That's a bad idea because you can get really overly optimistic estimates of performance by not including those data specific things inside of your resampling box. So that's what the next section is about. Um, one little thing just before we stop is this little picture here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to change the, the nomenclature here for good reason. So this is a, not every data set is like this, but this is, let's say, 80% of the time. As we start off with all of our data, like somebody brings us a disk back in the day, or like somebody gives you a database dump, and you have a finite amount of data, and you might split that into a training set and a test set. So that's not a controversial thing to do, right? But the resampling all happens on our training set. And so all these forms of resampling are, are iterative ways of making different variations of my training set data and splitting that in two. And one of those data sets, like the one that's at the bottom all the way on the left, it says analysis, that's what you build all your model and stuff on. And then you make predictions on this thing I'm calling the assessment set. And that's what you measure performance with. So in tenfold cross-validation, that analysis set would be like my initial 90% of my data, and the assessment set would be the 10% held out. And then I put the 10% back in, and then round robin. So I would get 10 different, instead of three here, I'd have 10 different resamples. Now the thing I'm trying to change is how we talk about that lowest level, because people always talk about training set and test set there, and it drives me nuts, because they'll talk about splitting their data in training and test, and then splitting in the training and test again. So the functions I use in our sample and the way I talk about this is the analysis set is the data like the sub-training set uh, that people talk about where it would be the 90% of cross-validation that is used to fit my models or do my pre-processing. And when I talk about the assessment set, that's like the out-of-bag sample or the holdout sample that we use to measure performance. So I'm not, when I talk about training and tests, I'm really, really specifically talking about that first split. Um, but when I talk about resampling, and the code will reflect this, it'll be the analysis set, like where you're estimating things, and the assessment set where you're measuring things. Okay, so that just to, we'll stop there, but just you'll see that a lot more both in code and in this diagram. Um, and I mean, it, every Stack Overflow question gets confused by this because you don't know what level of sampling people are talking about when they're talking about things. So I'm trying to change that nomenclature. Anyway, uh, so we'll come back in a half an hour. And um, any questions or anything, just, you know, write them down, ball them up and throw them at me, or just come up and talk to me. I'll be up here if you need me. Thanks.